I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my professional responsibility class about ABA Model Rule 4.4, Respect for the Rights of Third Persons. Now, we have other sections of the model rules about respecting your client's rights, for example, to make decisions in the case or to protect their confidentiality. We have rules about protecting the decorum and the rights of the tribunal or court, jurors, the opposing party and opposing counsel. This rule is about everybody else. It's about the things that we do as lawyers that can have collateral consequences or injure other people, even if it's not necessarily the client or the opposing party. Now, there's only two sections of this rule, an A and B section. They're very straightforward. If you have questions about this rule on the MPRE, they're likely to be pretty easy questions. And there's not a lot of questions about this on the MPRE. So let's take a look at our rule. This is 4.4a. In representing a client, a lawyer shall not use means that have no substantial purpose other than to embarrass, delay, or burden a third person, or use methods of obtaining evidence that violate the legal rights of such a person. Now, so let's talk about this for a moment and unpack it a little bit. We live in a time uh, where we have a debate going on in the public about cancel culture and doxing people and so forth. And on the one side, there's arguments to be made for holding people accountable for the things that they've said and done, even in the past. On the other hand, there's valid concerns about using public humiliation and stigma and ostracism and exposure merely as a political hit or as a way of censoring people with differing viewpoints or punishing someone just because they disagree with you or or maybe you just want to be spiteful. So whatever the merits of cancel culture and public embarrassment and social stigma, these things are out of bounds in terms of legal representation or things that you can do for your client as a lawyer. So if your client wants you to do something because they have a grudge against someone or they it's a business rival, someone that they're worried will bid on a contract or a grant that your client is hoping to obtain, all of those types of things, you can't do something just to embarrass um, or humiliate or bring public scrutiny on another party. The same is true about doing things just to cause delays or extra expenses and costs to another party. That's what we mean when we say burden a third person. And also note it says we, separately that methods of obtaining evidence. So no breaking into homes and offices to find incriminating information or illegal wiretapping um, or threatening people or trying to force them to divulge embarrassing information and so forth. Of course, that's not what usually is happening with lawyers. Usually we're concerned about lawyers doing things for their client just to embarrass a client's rival or a family member or someone that uh, a client's former employer or employee or something like that to try to bring social disapproval or a negative attention and negative publicity on another party. Okay, let's look at the B section, and this is mostly relate, unrelated to section A. A lawyer who receives a document or electronically stored information relating to the representation of the lawyer's client and knows, or reasonably should know, that the document or electronically stored information was inadvertently sent shall promptly notify the sender. That's it. That's the whole rule in section B. And so if you look at this, this is really just a notification requirement. And when does this happen? Most commonly during pretrial discovery. So the parties are, are producing documents for each other, hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of pages of receipts and memos and emails and internal company records and things like that. And when one side turns those over to the other, sometimes mistakes are made. Now, remember, in complex litigation with a large production request during discovery, they may have a whole team of staff and maybe even some temporary employees helping gather all the documents and put them together and review them and sort them and so forth. Sometimes something 
gets included that was supposed to be privileged and confidential. How will you know? Sometimes it says attorney work product privileged and confidential right across the top and you start reading it and it's clearly uh, the opposing counsel's brainstorming session or notes to the file about what they think are the strengths and weaknesses of the case or things to watch out for or evidence they wish they had but can't find and, and so on. It could be private correspondence between opposing counsel and the opposing party, their client or their client to them. This could be emails. Sometimes this type of inadvertent disclosure occurs through emails because you were CC'd on something or someone hit reply all from an earlier email thread that you were supposed to be part of, maybe it was about scheduling, and the new email has some confidential or privileged information. So what do you have to do? The duty here is it promptly, that means right away, don't wait a week, don't have a bunch of meetings about it, don't let the other side stew and worry, pick up the phone, call the other side, whoever sent this sensitive information to you, and it's pretty obvious that you weren't supposed to receive it, and say, just a heads up, you sent this and I'm not sure you meant to. This allows the other party to prepare or to start to try to mitigate or do damage control or think about how they're going to deal with the fact that this information was exposed. Now, keep in mind, the lawyer's brainstorming or theory of the case memo might be something they included intentionally just as a decoy document to throw you off. Probably not. Uh, usually incompetence is the simpler explanation, but there are stories about lawyers doing that, putting things in there in the production request that were really just to mess with the other side. But even, either way, if it appears to you or reasonably should appear to you that no one would have sent this to you intentionally, you have a duty to notify them about that. Now, the comments don't add much to this except to say what is not covered by this rule. The whole rule, remember, for 4.4b is to notify the other side. Also keep in mind, it's for things relating to the representation of the client. So if somebody you've never heard of before, out of the blue, just sends something to you by chance because of, they had the wrong address, it was delivered to you by the postal service by mistake, um, they, you have a similar email address to another lawyer and so someone sent you something just who you've never heard of, this rule imposes no duty. Also, the comments note that this doesn't really say that you have a duty under this rule to return physical documents or to delete emails or delete electronic files that you were sent inadvertently. You may have local or state rules that's outside of the scope of this rule. And of course, if you're calling the other side to tell them that you received something, you've obviously already read it. And in the modern age of digital uh, uh, things, there's always the possibility that it's still on a hard drive or still backed up on a server somewhere and so forth. So this rule doesn't really create a duty to delete. You may offer to do that as a professional courtesy, though. The other thing that the rule doesn't address is what happens with waiver of attorney-client privilege if you're sent a privileged document. And there, we have a large body of law about privilege and waiver with disclosures. There are cases where a lawyer has sort of inadvertently made a mistake during discovery and has waived privilege to certain information or a certain document. And there's other cases going the other way. There's exceptions and exceptions to the exception, as you would imagine. And what Rule 4.4 says in the comments is we're not coming down on the question of whether privilege has been waived or not. That's up to the common law of privilege in your jurisdiction. Okay, let's have a quick review question to see if you've been paying attention. To help a client obtain a lucrative commercial contract, an attorney uncovered and publicized unfavorable information about a competitor who might also bid on the contract. Could the attorney be subject to discipline? Yes or no? Hopefully you know the answer to that. And if you don't, I'm not sure you are paying attention and you should probably rewatch the video. That concludes though, our video about model rule 4.4.